How you doing everybody? Welcome to another edition of Behind the Door. You can see right now we're going over the Leo Frigo Bridge in Green Bay, down at the bottom of the Bay of Green Bay. The city is off to the left. We are headed over to the other side of the Bay of Green Bay today, to the town of Marinette, Wisconsin, which is on the border of Michigan, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, separated by the Menominee River. And the reason we're heading over here today is because it's kind of a historical event happening that's related to Fincantieri shipbuilding. Now, you've heard me talk of Fincantieri Bay shipbuilding in Sturgeon Bay, those of you who are familiar with the channel. And this is their sister yard, 24 miles across the bay in Marinette, Wisconsin. And although it's only 24 miles away, as the crow flies, or as the horse flies, it is a... Uh, about 120 mile drive because we have to go down the peninsula around the heel of Green Bay and up the eastern side of the state of Wisconsin on the west side of the Bay of Green Bay till we get to Marinette. The reason we're headed there today is there is a ship launch. It is a uh, Freedom Class naval vessel. LCS 31 is the designation, soon to be the USS Cleveland. Marinette Marine's been doing work for the U.S. Navy since 1942. They've turned out over 1,500 vessels for them uh, over the years. And like I said, it's the sister yard to uh, Fincantieri Bay Ship Company in Sturgeon Bay. It's the last side launch that they're gonna you know, run down a sled into the river, into the Menominee River. So from here on out, they're all gonna be like belt launches, you know, just place them in. So, <clears throat> I'm driving 120 miles or whatever it is for a five second photo. <laughs> and here's hoping I make it. Now the other issue that I have is <laughs> getting a view of where this boat is launching from. I have to go on to the Michigan side uh, over the Menominee River and then shoot back toward uh, Marinette Marine for the launch. But there's a lot of industry along the river there. There's a, a wastewater treatment plant along the river. There's a, what I believe is a closed down paper mill there, a processing plant. Um, yeah, so I don't know where I am going to be able to set up. A lot of that is private property. So we'll find out when we get there, which is another reason why I wanted to get there early. It's got out a place to shoot. So one of the things I'm most nervous about today is getting the shot because there's not going to be any second attempt. You have one opportunity that'll slide down that ramp into the water, create this big wave, and uh, literally it's over in, you know, five, ten seconds. So I would be pretty disappointed if I drove like 250 miles to get a shot and I didn't get the shot. But I weighed that against the fact about how historic this is and I decided to, you know, go for the adventure. So I'm getting nervous about it now though. <laughs> A great old history to this town. Here are all the invited guests, dignitaries waiting to get in. A lot of Navy personnel. Big day launching a ship. We better go find a place across the river to uh, see if we can't find a, a vantage spot here to get this shot. We're really going to be disappointed if we can't find one. Welcome to Pure Michigan. 
there is no shot from on the Marinette side of the river by where we saw all the dignitaries. So I came across the bridge over the Menominee River into Michigan. Welcome to Pure Michigan. And I noticed going over the bridge that there is a park. If I turn right here, thank God for GPS maps, huh? And if I can get to this park, there's a direct view. See where that loop is there? Oh yeah, all kinds of people down here now. I think I found the spot. Yeah, by the wastewater treatment plant. There's some police out there making sure people get where they need to go. All right, get to that park and set up. It's a little bit of a walk. There are a lot of people here, more than I expected. But it is a Saturday and it is a pretty historic event. So we have a, I don't know, quarter mile walk into this park going by the wastewater treatment plant. Yeah, <clears throat> that'll wake you up in the morning. It was a real picnic-like atmosphere. A beautiful spring day, people with their dogs and kids, strollers, scooters, wagons, crying babies, and beer because, well, it was after nine in the morning. I arrived early enough that I staked out a three-foot square space near the end of an observation deck on the river's edge and set up my gear among the curious onlookers and with a clear view of the anticipated launch. As you might be able to tell, I get a bit self-conscious shooting in situations like this. A lot of people here. <laughs> a lot of people. Surprised. I'm all set up. Just waiting for uh, wait for things to start. It's supposed to start at 10 o'clock. Um, it's 10 o'clock now. Nothing yet. So we wait. Got to be ready. Like I said, five seconds. So this, the 16th and last Freedom Variant littoral combat ship, is a coastal craft designed by Lockheed Martin and built in just 10 months at a cost to taxpayers of approximately $400 million. She's 388 feet long with a 58-foot beam, a 14-foot draft, and maintains a crew of 50. Her monohull makes her fast, agile, and lightweight, clocking in at 2,760 tons and able to top out at a speed of 40 knots. Start the cloud over. It'd be nicer if it was sunny, I think. We'll see. Some breaks in the clouds. Ceremonies apparently started inside. There's a guy here who has somebody on the inside. They keep sending video. But there are a lot of introductions to be made, so. We'll see, it'll probably be closer to 11 o'clock than 10 o'clock by the time they get this thing launched. We're all here waiting. It was now well past 11 o'clock. Tension built, comments were made, everyone was on standby. And the people kept filing into the mystery ship marina. Their anticipation soon gave way to frustration. While across the river, the echoes of pomp and pageantry, speechifying, and the strains of the marine band faintly floated over the water. Then around 11.20, the tug William C. Gaynor, along with tugs Donald J. Sarter on the stern, the Cameron O. and Jacqueline Avon nearby, they were all there to assist, coming over from Sturgeon Bay earlier that day. They began to take their positions, and when the all-clear horn was sounded, we knew the launch would be just seconds away. But something was not right. There was no all-clear signal given. The sled was released, and the 
3,000 ton combat ship slid down the ramp directly toward the stern of the unaware William C. Gaynor. Looked like when the boat came down the ramp, and I have, I have uh, my video going here. It looked like it might have hit the William C. Gaynor Doug uh, when it came down the ramp. Uh, we heard a big crash, like it might have uh, hit the back of the the tug. We'll see. Here's a closer look. Listen for the crowd cheering. Followed a few seconds later by the release of the sled. After she hits the water, a loud thwop, and the tug teeters. You can hear it among the crowd, a combination of cheers and screams and hesitant applause and whispered comments. Here it is again, in super slow motion. The gainer pulls the bow line taut. On the gangway, a ceremonial bottle of champagne is broken against the bow, but the gainer is not in position and not fully prepared. There are still crew on deck. One crew member, realizing the launch was underway, grabs the rail as he runs from the stern up the port side deck, but he's unable to get to safety, so he pulls his body against the cabin wall and braces for impact. A 40-foot wall of water completely engulfs the gainer as the gunwale of the Navy ship strikes the starboard transom of the tug, forcing the bow to lift above the surface, and the tug bobs in the water from the repercussions. A black scuff mark from the tug's iron hull leaves evidence of impact on the combat ship. The crew on deck seem shocked and dazed by the unexpected experience, but miraculously, there appear to be no injuries. No one was thrown overboard by the force of the water and the crew members on deck begin to assess for any damage. There was obviously a lapse in communication by someone, somewhere, and no doubt the incident is under investigation. And what started out as a sunny and beautiful warm spring day full of hope and excitement was now tarnished by what was just short of a potentially fatal tragedy with hundreds of people looking on. I feel for the crew members aboard the William C. Gaynor and the others. I can't imagine the terror and helplessness they must have felt tethered to that massive ship bearing down on them, unable to move out of harm's way. It was a long and sobering drive home. I couldn't stop thinking about what I had just witnessed and how close those men came to their deaths. It hit me in the pit of my stomach. It was awful. I couldn't even download the footage for several days. And creating this video has really been difficult. Usually when I successfully capture a photo that I plan and I set out to take, there's a certain personal pride that I feel in that accomplishment. Not this time. Like many photographers, I suppose, when I view a photo that I've taken, the entire experience is relived. Every tactile detail that went into it, every sight, every sound, Every smell and every emotion that I felt 
that possessed me at that moment that I hit the shutter is instantly relived. This, knowing that I captured the very moment in time when the crew of the William C. Gaynor stood on this dividing line of life and death, it's not one that I take comfort in. But it is a reminder of how precious and how fragile our lives on earth truly are. And for that, I'm grateful.